So we've had Romans 15 read for us this morning. It's, it's, a saying, it's a saying of mine, I haven't seen it scripturally, but the greatest blessing and perhaps the greatest trial that God's left us is the ecclesia that we find ourselves in now. This is the seedbed, the pillar and, and, and uh, floor of the truth, as Paul describes to Timothy. This is a place where we know we can come, where there are, everyone has the same beliefs. We all have the same hope. We all are looking for the same thing, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ and the promised fulfilment of those promises that God made to the Father so many years ago of his kingdom finally being here on earth. And in this place, everyone has the same hope and, and that's, a great, that's a great thing in this world where the truth itself is being thrown out the window and truth is relative. But Paul writes his letter to the Roman Ecclesia. We know the circumstances. He's, he's writing it to them from Corinth. And it was going to be a number of years before he would finally find himself in amongst the brothers and sisters at, at Rome. And it would be very different circumstances to probably what he had in mind as he wrote this letter. Nevertheless, the will of God would be that he would finally meet the brothers and sisters of, of Rome. And he gives to them this letter that we have on our, on our lap here. And in wrapping up this letter to them, which is one of the longest that, that he wrote, he gives them some very simple rules about what it's going to take to live in a harmonious ecclesial environment. And the context for this begins back in chapter 13, where if you want to turn back there to Romans 13, if you don't already have that open on your laps, um, and if you've got the same version of, of Bible as I have, it's just across the page. We're going to look at verse 9 of Romans 14, where Paul summarizes the teaching of the law of Moses, if you like, and he quotes from Leviticus there, where he says, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, nor, nor be a false witness, shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment as briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then in the next verse, he expands on what that teaching means. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So here, if you like, is the principle of harmonious ecclesial life that Paul is setting out for us. In chapter 15, verse 1, he goes on to say that we who are strong, we have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So it's not enough for us to not do bad things to our neighbor. We're, not, we're told that we don't just do, avoid doing bad things to our neighbor. We actually have to be positive he goes on to say, let us each please our neighbor for his good to build him up. So under the law of Moses, leaving your neighbor alone and doing nothing bad to him brought a tick. But under the law of Christ that we find ourselves now, that's not enough. We no longer live to please ourselves. Our service is no longer to ourself. We must please our neighbor to do good and to build them up. And we know from the parable that Christ told to the lawyer, who's our neighbor? It's not the person sitting and living alongside of us. It's not even the brother or sister sitting to your left or right hand now. It's everyone with whom we come in contact. And that was the purpose of the parable that, that Jesus gave to the lawyer that even the Samaritan, those unworthy people in the eyes of the Jews, even those Samaritans were to be treated as a neighbor because we have a greater gift than just healing bodily wounds. We have a greater gift that we can give to our neighbors, and that is the gift of eternal life. So under the law of Christ, it's not good enough to just please ourselves. We must please our neighbor to do good and to build them up. We certainly must not ignore 
or trample over the sensitivities of our brothers and sisters, but we certainly must work for the good of our brothers and sisters and to build them up. And we're called upon to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and to serve each other here in the ecclesia of our Lord Jesus and everywhere we might find ourselves, whether that's at work, at home, at the shops, on the road, or even when we're alone. And our service is focused not on ourselves and what we can get, but on the good of others and how we can build each other up. Paul gives the same lesson when in in the lesson in the in the letter, I should say, to the Galatians in chapter five, where he says, "The fulfilment of all of the law is in loving the neighbour as yourself." And so, what's the best gauge? <clears throat> excuse me, of what we should or shouldn't do in a circumstance. And it's always, what would our Lord Jesus Christ do? What would he do? Because Mark chapter 10 tells us, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Paul, in chapter 15, verse 3, draws us back to our Lord Jesus Christ where he says, for even Christ, our example, our great Lord, please not himself. Or as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Or as the New Living Translation says, Christ didn't live to please himself. Now this is totally contrary, isn't it, to the teaching of the world today. And as it says at the end of Judges, which is the principle of, of every common man, everyone does that which is right in their own eyes. That's the, that's the yardstick today. You please yourself. What, what's this? You do you is the saying, isn't it? But that's not serving Christ because Christ himself pleased not himself. Jesus' way of life is quite different from anything that we know today, anything that we see exampled for us in the world around. Jesus said in John chapter 6, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So we have to ask, as we come here this morning, to eat the bread and drink the wine that our Lord Jesus Christ shared that night with us, giving himself for us, is this our calling do? Are we here not to do our own will, but the will of him who sent us? Do we live to please God? And if so, how do we do that? How do we please God? Well, we do it by following the example of his son who's on the table here. We follow the command. Yes, we're obeying that by eating bread and drinking wine, but we need to take that principle and live that principle every day of our life thereafter, giving ourselves as Christ gave his body and his blood for us, even upon the stake. The Weymouth translates that verse as, For even Christ did not seek his own pleasure. His principle was, Weymouth's translation is, his principle was the reproaches which they addressed to thee have fallen on me. So this was the the life principle, if you like, that Jesus lived. As he served his nation, as he went through that nation in those three and a half years, healing and teaching and rebuking the leaders and, he, and bringing his apostles with him, it was always with the mindset that the reproaches that were falling upon his people or that God was about to bring upon his people were falling upon him. But even down to a personal level, that the reproaches in their physical impairments that they were coming to him to heal, he literally took them upon himself. He willingly touched the lepers and the blind and the dumb and the mad and took their reproach, their physical reproach, upon himself. So leave your finger there in Romans 15, and we're going to go back to where Jesus is quoting from in Psalm 69. 
He's quoting from a psalm there of David, but when you look at the words, the words could really only be truly spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. So David wrote them a couple of millennia before. So in Psalm 69, we'll read from verse 8 for context. Jesus writes, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house, God, hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach you, God, have fallen upon me. So as we said, it could be only really Jesus who could say these words. This was Jesus' mission to show his people his father, their father, and to show them how far removed they were from him and his teaching of what they should be. The religious rulers rejected God, and in rejecting God, they rejected his son and everything that he represented. And instead of embracing Jesus as their Messiah and Saviour, what did they do? Instead, they struck him. They spat upon him. They rebuked him. Rebuked him. They rejected God and said, We have no king but Caesar. Take him away. Crucify him. And they demanded that the Jews, that the Romans, I should say, should crucify their own saviour. This was the way they treated his son, the son, God's son. And so indeed, the re reproach that they gave to God fell upon his son. And so it was, of course, that in the death of Jesus that ultimately he did bear the reproach of his people. But, but by our association in baptism with that rebuked man, Jesus is able to take away our reproach also. So how wonderful is the mind of God to have worked all of this out and known all of this in advance to bring us, as we read there in Romans 15, us as Gentiles cast off to bring us into the most holy place through that torn, through that torn veil. So the Jews, in their blasphemous a murderous triumph over Jesus that day actually fulfilled God's grand purpose. And as he hung upon that stake, and as the, the curtain into the most holy place was torn, that opened the way into the holiest for us as Gentiles to come in to worship the God that the Jews of faithful Abraham had rejected. And so as the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, Peter wrote. And in Paul writing to the Corinthians, he finds himself amongst in, in his second letter in chapter 5, he wrote to them that God was in this whole work that Jesus knew as he sat down with the disciples to share that meal, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing our trespasses to us, but he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. And now we must, as ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ to be reconciled to God. For he, Jesus, was made to be as a sinner for us, who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. How wonderful is the mind of a heavenly father that he knew very well that though his righteous son had done nothing worthy of death, that the Jews, his own people, would take him and crucify him. And through that, he would become our ambassador. And that's where Jesus sits now, at the right hand of our heavenly father, as an ambassador to us, taking our prayers for forgiveness to God, his Father and ours. And in response then, what do we do? We must then become ambassadors as well for Christ. We must share this 
wonderful truth with our neighbours, our neighbours beside us, keep encouraging each other, but our neighbours either side of us at home. We must become ambassadors to, to Christ, first with each other here, and then with everyone with whom we come in contact. Verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures we have hope. Or as the ESV says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So God has caused the things that were written to be preserved for us today to encourage us and to comfort us about the enduring hope that we have. So the first word there in our, in our AV that's translated as patience, or maybe if you've got the ESV, it's that word endurance, is the word hupomoni, if that's Greek. Maybe David can correct us here. <laughs> um, it means endurance, perseverance, cheerful or hopeful patience. And the second word there in the AV translated as comfort is the same word that Jesus uses when he's talking to the disciples about the comforter that he would send, paraclesis. So it means encouragement, also comfort and exhortation. So the scriptures become our source of hope. The word of God can comfort us when we feel alone or lost. They can be a source of encouragement when our spiritual drive wavers. And they can exhort us and give us a shove back in the right direction when we find ourselves being led astray by this world. And it pays for us to be reminded, of course, of the words of the first principle quote in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that we often hear cited at baptisms, of which there may be some coming up here soon at Moorbank, which I hear will be a lovely event. And Paul writes that, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, or for teaching what is right, for teaching what is not right, for teaching how to get right, and for teaching how to stay right. That as men and women of God, we might be perfect, thoroughly furnished, to complete all the good works that are set before us. So it's interesting in the context where we're talking about the righteousness of Christ that Paul should be highlighting the value of Scripture to help us as an instruction in righteousness these thousands of years later. This is the value of the word that's sitting here on your lap. The Scriptures were vital in the spiritual life of our Lord Jesus Christ and they should be in ours also. They were his connection with his heavenly father. There was no direct revelation to him except what was in the word itself. We know that angels, angels ministered to him, but he knew his father through his understanding of the scriptures. And that's the way that's still available to us also. Through the scriptures, we can draw closer to the mind and character and purpose of our heavenly father who's called each one of us. So back in verse 4, one translation has it that the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we patiently wait for God's, fulfill, God's promises to be fulfilled. So unless you're reading your Bible, you have no hope. Or if you have a hope, that hope is uncertain. It's without the word of God, we come like a rudderless ship, directionless, blown about by whatever the winds might dictate. Only through our understanding of the scriptures do we have a real hope, a real direction, a real purpose in our lives. And in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 15, Paul gives a little prayer, a prayer to understand our need for encouragement and endurance, to look out for each other and to value the scriptures that teach us about his God. And then he uses the same words he uses to describe God to describe, oh, sorry, the other way around. The same words he uses to describe the scriptures in verse 4, he uses to describe God. So in verse 4, 
he talks about the scriptures as being for patience and comfort. It's exactly the same words he's using relating to God, that God is the same God of patience and comfort, or as we read in the ESV, endurance and encouragement. So it's no wonder really that Paul should be using the same words because the scriptures come from God. They are an expression of his mind, an expression of his character, an expression of his will. So they're synonymous. God is the same as his mind, which is the same as his word, which is the same as his actions. And so there's an exhortation for us also. Our word and our actions should be synonymous. And our word and our actions should line up with what the scriptures tell us. And if they do, then they're lining up also with the teaching of God and the teaching of his son. Because as we know, Jesus Christ is called the word made flesh. So in that sense, the book that's sitting on your Bible now, on your lap right now, the Bible, is God. The book that's sitting on your lap right now is also our Lord Jesus Christ, who was God's word made flesh. So it then leads us to ask the question, well, how much respect do we pay this book? Literally and figuratively. When we leave here and go home, do we throw the book into the corner until we come back out next Sunday? Or is this book like our God should be, part of our daily life? Do we spend time with God and his word? Because this is an indication of the extent of the relationship that we have with God and with his son. Think about this. If you have a friend who you implicitly trust and whose advice you seek, what do you do? If you want to talk to them, you'll sit down, you'll make sure that all of the distractions are set aside. You'll turn your phone onto silent. You'll, if you've got the radio on, you'll turn it off. You'll close the door so that you can focus on your friend and the advice that he's about to give you or her is about to give you. This is the same approach that we should have when we're reading the scripture. Here's God's advice to us. His user guide, if you like, to living a godly life to find yourselves in the kingdom. So when, how, so how, first of all, how often do we sit down and read this and do we give it the attention that it deserves or is it just another tick in the box? Yes, I've done the readings today. If we think of the word of God being like this close, wise friend, how do we engage with it? Understanding what the scriptures reveal will teach us about the character of God Understanding what the scriptures reveal will give us the endurance and encouragement to continue. We don't know, none of us know how long this race will be. But our understanding will give us a comfort because we know that God is in control of all things. And it will help us day by day to run that race, to be there when Christ does return. But Jesus is more than God's son, if that's not enough. He was, as we said, the God's word made flesh. Christ lived his life in total submission to his father's will and pleased his father in all things. And it was Jesus' preparedness to serve and obey to the very end, even that death upon the cross that we remember this morning, that allowed the father to glorify him and bring him to his right hand. And he taught us that we ought not to please ourselves, but that we ought to bear the infirmities, the weaknesses, the failings, the sensitivities of others in greater measure when we look to God to forgive our own weaknesses and failings, etc. Now, we will find this hard to do because it's not natural for us, but we are called to be above the natural man. We need to go back to the source back to God, back to his word, back to his son Jesus Christ who calls us to remember him this morning in this simple meal of bread and wine that we're about to share. For surely we're living in the last days. The last days before our Lord will return to call us all as servants together 
and see whether we've been wise and faithful servants with the talents given to each one of us, whatever they may be. So let's now set aside a little time and turn off the distractions of the world and give our undivided attention and show some respect that's worthy to the God of heaven, our maker. In Lee's last days, the lesson for us is to live in harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, coming here together, as Paul goes on to say, in one accord with one mouth to glorify God and be like-minded one toward another. So we're going to close, going often where we, we do at this time, to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read it a little out of sequence. <laughs> and then we're going to read, first of all, verses 5 to 8. Paul exhorts us, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Then back to verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort, any encouragement, any exhortation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels, and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem his other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And so, brothers and sisters, let us love our neighbour as ourselves, and let's eat and drink wine in remembrance of him who came not to serve, to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Mm -hmm.